Welcome everyone to Healthcare for All, brought to you by WCANRadio.com. This program examines the issues of healthcare for you. Join us now in the studio where the program is in progress. Welcome to Healthcare for All, sponsored by SPAN Ohio. I'm Debbie Silverstein, your host, and I'm in the WCAN studios with my co-host, Eric Meadows. Hello, Eric. How you doing, Debbie? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. You know, we've been doing this show now, what, 15 months? Something like and that. And it is absolutely amazing to see how it's evolved. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from, you know, from you know radio to now where it's being broadcast for a 30-day period. And right. all of our listeners can, can listen to it. And we've even have a, uh, a comment block uh, box at the bottom of it where people can make comments on the show right it is it is just so amazing to look at health care and see what it is or what it is not mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I have enjoyed most about the show is that you've taken the cloak off of it and said okay let's take a look and see what you're not getting and what you do deserve and what the your rights actually are you, you've learned a lot Eric I've learned quite a bit you know it's almost like if I could go back into the matrix and just live in that that nether world of just imagining life full you know, full of bliss and happiness and never having to worry about health care I think I might but well I'm in the real world. Right, right. And you know too much to ever go back into yes, that blissful state of not knowing. Yes. And yes. Um, we've, been, we've, we've taught you too well. Yes. You know, yeah. you, you know, one of the things I have to say is that before we bring our guest in is um, that a lot of people who have listened in, you've done that same service right. for them. It, you know, they can now see health care for what it, it is, what it is not. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, we have such a convoluted system of health care that it provides us with a never-ending list of topics to mm -hmm. talk about. Yes, yes. And, um, and with that, I think we'll introduce tonight's guest because we have a brand new topic to talk about tonight. We're going to be talking about Medicare Advantage plans uh -huh. and Medicaid. Okay. You know, two systems that we have, Medicare and Medicaid. Our guest tonight is Dr. Ann Sheets. She's a member of PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Program. She's also an organizer for the Illinois Single Payer Coalition. Um, she's the secretary for the Inc Illinois Single Payer Coalition People with Disabilities Commission Committee and also a corresponding secretary. Ann, you're way too busy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an active uh, medical practice as well? No, uh, Debbie, I closed my medical practice about two and a half years ago in order to volunteer full-time working on single-payer health care. You know, there's an awful lot of doctors that have done that. There are quite a few, yes. And, People who can do it decide to do that. And what would, you know, what would, what would make you close your practice to do this? Well, I, the last 10 years of my practice, I was doing um, home visits full-time, so mm -hmm. I uh, worked out of my house, went out to see people who were not able to leave home to get medical care. Uh -huh. So I saw them at close quarters, and I also saw a lot of their families. And I saw so many uh, problems that my patients and families had getting access to health care and paying for it that eventually I decided it was intolerable to not do something about that and I turned the care of my patients over to other physicians and decided to work on the health care system. Well Anne, if I can ask you a question, um, you saw these patients, uh, what, not receiving good health care? Well, let me, in the case of families, yes, that was often the case. So for example, I was taking care of an elderly couple, a husband and wife, and their adult daughter had stayed at home to take care of them. They were both very disabled, homebound. She also had a disabled uh, adult son. She stayed home to take care of these three people. She lived on their social security, mm -hmm. um, and she had no, no health insurance. Um, and she had terrible asthma, not something I could even begin to take care of at home. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. needed to see a specialist. She needed medication. She needed some tests done. When she was walking around in the house, just taking care of her family, I would hear her wheezing. And that's a terrible thing. This is a wealthy country that a woman who's taking care of three people, keeping them in the community and out of a nursing home, herself cannot get access to care. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a terrible thing to me. And that kind of a scenario replays itself over and over and over again. It does. You know, to an extent that, that, that would really astound people if they had any indication of how common that really is. I think it's something people in other countries uh, find it beyond their imagination. Mm -hmm. They just can't see how, 
how a wealthy country can have a system that works in this way. So, Anne, to close your practice now and begin to, to advocate for a lot of these people, uh, can you tell us the benefits that both you're having and the, these that you're advocating for? Well, I can't say that the people I'm advocating for have had any immediate benefit. We know what a what the enemies of single payer are, the people who don't want it to happen, the insurance companies and the pharmaceutical industry with their immense wealth and power. So this is going to be a long, hard struggle. Uh, nonetheless, I think that, it, of course, it has to start somewhere. It has to start wherever we are. And I, although I loved my practice, I also love what I do now trying to change the whole system in which we work. Mm -hmm. And I feel that this is what I should be doing at this time in my life. And is that what led you to be a member of Physicians for a National Health Program? I joined Physicians for a National Health Program sometime in the 1990s. I'm not wow. sure when, you know, long before I closed my practice. So I always saw this as an important issue. But when I was in practice, of course, I didn't have very much time to give to it. Um, and now I, that's what I do all the time. Mm -hmm. and tell us a little bit about PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Program. It was founded in, I think, uh, 1989 or maybe 1987, and originally the founders were concerned about Medicaid, um, one of the things we're going to talk about tonight. They said, uh, in a wealthy country, uh, Medicaid is not uh, an appropriate system for poor people. They deserve much better than that. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a, a system that segregates out poor people for a lower level of care. Right. And so they started an organization to work to to correct that, mm -hmm. to make um, Medicaid better, and that evolved into concern with the people who had no insurance at all, and concern with people who had other kinds of insurance that was becoming uh, worse and worse, more unaffordable, mm -hmm. um, worse coverage, restricted networks, and eventually it became an organization that said, we need one system of care that serves everybody, in which everybody has the same high quality care the same access, the same coverage, and that's what Physicians for a National Health Program now works for. And we say well, that health care is a human right. Well, mm -hmm. well Anne, Anne, I do have to ask you, you know, I mean, um, you said Medicaid is not meeting the need for those who are, are, are beneath the poverty line? In no way. No, it, it does not meet people's needs. How so? I mean, I mean... It's hard to imagine because I, I used to work with the county and we administered Medicaid and it seemed like a program that would help, you know, uh, mothers and, and families and children, you know, to mm -hmm. help get them health care. So you're saying it's, it's less than what the average person or wage earner is actually going to get? Well, it's, uh, now I can't say that that's true in every part of the country because Medicaid varies from state to state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in general, um, it pays more pays less to providers than uh, employer-sponsored health care and then Medicare, which means there are fewer providers who are willing to take it. And uh, although it, some people who have employer-sponsored insurance are actually worse off than people with Medicaid, it depends on what kind of insurance coverage they have. Uh, but, but Medicaid does not cover in any way everything that people need. Of course, that's true for every part of our health care system. Mm -hmm. Medicare, uh, employer-sponsored insurance, it's, it's rare to have insurance that covers everything that you need without placing financial barriers on people. Well, the difference being is that those of us that are not, uh, you know, living in poverty, you know, mm -hmm. under the definition of poverty, have a better chance that we can afford it on our own than somebody that is living at those levels of poverty that, that these people are. And then the other part of that, too, is that the, the Medicare, Medicaid program um, does not generally cover single adults who don't have children mm -hmm. or who are not severely disabled. Right. There are many people who, who need it who are too poor and to, are not working in the right jobs to get health insurance, and they're not covered. That's right. true. It's just another example of how complex our system is and the hoops that people have to go through and that it's a matter of chance whether you have access to care or not. Mm -hmm. well, and, no, no, and, 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 you know, and I think part of it is, you know, we can say we're doing something for them mm -hmm. and it salves our conscience. That can mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. and that, yes. but, but you're right that um, you know, it's difficult for them to find providers. We complain, mm -hmm. complain about them clogging up the ERs, you know, the Medicaid patients. But as you remember our guest from, from last month, 
the ER physicians mm -hmm, said they've yes. got nowhere else to go. Right. That's right, correct. Right. And well, actually, that's a common problem in our health in the U.S. healthcare system is uh, for people of uh, all kinds of people to access care after hours and on work uh, and on weekends. Mm -hmm. That's a, a major problem here. Of course, it's challenging everywhere, but it's a major problem, particularly in the U.S. Well, mm -hmm. and I've noticed that especially you know, and this is employer-sponsored insurance. Mm -hmm. They're putting um, co-pays on to go to a walk-in clinic. Yeah. You know, say on a Saturday or a Sunday, and the only thing that does is discourage people from going. And by Absolutely. the time they do get in to see their regular physician, then, then they may have a more serious condition than if they had gone to the walk-in clinic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm hearing the two of you as private citizens talk about this, and if you're able to see that, don't you think our government is also able to see it? And if that's the case, why aren't they moving on this? Well, our our government responds to the interests of the health insurance and pharmaceutical industries who have this huge uh, wealth that they can donate to campaign, uh, to, to uh, election campaigns. Mm -hmm. And also we see, that I think we see it most easily at the federal level, um, a revolving door of people who work in government and then work, go into these industries, into the health insurance and pharmaceutical industries, and sometimes rotate back and forth. So the author, the person who actually wrote uh, the 2010 health care bill that we call the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. had before that been working for WellPoint and then has now gone on to work um, for um, a, a pharmaceutical interest. Mm -hmm. Wow. So yeah, well point, yeah, well points an insurance company. An insurance mm -hmm. company, mm -hmm. exactly. And that, and um, you know, so <laughs> it, it just gets more complicated. We had somebody on here who talked about the fact that the insurance companies were spending almost um, you know, a little over a million dollars a day mm -hmm. lobbying against our interests mm -hmm. when we were discussing health care reform at the federal level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, lobbying against the things that would help the people, the patients. Absolutely. And that, so you know, your premium dollars at work, right? <laughs> <laughs> to work okay. Against okay. You. Profit, um, okay. That's what for-profit companies are about. They're about making profit. Right. They're not about the common good. Yes, but we're talking about the government. You know, well, for yeah, the we're people, gonna, by the people. You know, yeah. and and I would give, just give that idea up, Eric. Okay. <laughs> it's not you, know, happening. you would just you would just think that they they would be more conscious. I know that that you know. Uh, well, it's, and it's only going to get worse with the uh, the Supreme Court decision on Citizens mm -hmm, United. Mm -hmm. and, and and I just wanted to say I was just being sarcastic about, you know, the two of you as private citizens, and don't you think our government can see that I know that they can see it you know and I know that there is a problem with uh, uh, the insidiousness of insurance companies having to constantly answer to their uh, uh, supporters mm -hmm. you know the ones that they have to pay out their profits to yeah. and staying in business you know it's just a shame that it's infiltrated itself into the government right well one yeah, of the things is our aim as a movement to change that and to create mm -hmm. a government that is responsive to the people and however difficult that that may be, we don't have a choice if we want our children and grandchildren to live in a world where they can live mm -hmm. in, in safety. Well, and, and part of that making the government responsive is that we the people have to take a more active role mm -hmm. in that government. We don't have to be government officials, but we have to stay on top of what they're doing and we have to stay in contact with the people that we elect mm -hmm. to do that job. Sure. And we have to give them direction on what they should or should not be doing. Absolutely. And, and too many of us do not even take the time to pick up the phone and let our elected representatives know what we think. Mm -hmm. People are afraid of our elected representatives. The representatives should be bowing down and kissing our feet. Right. You know, we've got this whole thing backwards. Okay. And that. Well, I want to get um, back to Physicians for a National Health Program does a lot of wonderful research on this whole topic. Um, they've, they've published a lot of research over mm -hmm. the years, and I use that extensively in my advocating. And one of the things that they did um, that came out last fall was a study about Medicare Advantage plans yes. that exist. Um, we talk about Medicare as being a model that we could use. We could improve the coverage of Medicare, and we can expand it to give it to all people. And that's, you know, usually we say Medicare for all, expanded and improved. Right. Mm-hmm. Medicare Advantage plans are a little bit different. Absolutely. What are they? Well, they're privatized Medicare. So Medicare was, was uh, passed into law in 1964, and immediately the private insurance industry, which of course did not want to have to, to pay for the care of all these elderly people, those are the people who get sick. Mm -hmm. um, nonetheless, once there was money from the government for that, 
started um, a public relations campaign to convince people that private insurance is better than government insurance. Okay. And in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and up till today, there have been various experiments with uh, privatizing portions of Medicare, and the current version of that is the Medicare Advantage plans. So uh, Medicare gives a certain amount of money per enrollee to the insurance companies who then uh, use that money, some of that money, uh, obviously not all of it, to provide for the care of the people who are enrolled in their plan. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good thing, isn't it? It turns out to be a bad thing. How so? It, it sounds like it should be good. Um, they, they, there are, there's a long list of problems with it. But So we have this uh, assumption that private is always better than public, and it tur turns out not to be the case that public is, in fact, more efficient and less expensive than private when it comes to health care. Mm -hmm. So the, these Medicare Advantage plans um, cherry-pick the healthiest seniors to cover, and they get paid uh, more than what the average beneficiary costs, so they get paid extra for taking care of healthier people. Um, they, we, we say that the healthy go in and the sick come out. So they have ways of discouraging people from remaining in their plans when they get sick. How do they and do that? The most important reason mm -hmm. way seems to be that they, they're restricted networks so that when a person gets a serious illness like cancer mm -hmm. or something that requires specialized care, because of the restricted networks, they don't have access to the providers that they want and need, and they'll decide to leave at that point. So that's a common reason for people to decide to disenroll from the Medicare Advantage plan which they can only do once a year. So mm -hmm. in the meantime, they're stuck. Right. Um, but other reasons that people decide to disenroll, they, they um, are not given accurate information when they sign up. Um, so, for instance, a patient will be told that, oh, yeah, your doctor's in this plan. You can continue to see the same doctor. And then they go to see the doctor and find out the doctor's not in the plan. By that time, it's too late. So right. this is a source of friction then between the, the patient and the the. Um, position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another pro problem that people have brought up is traveling, you know, that you're retired, absolutely. you're on Medicare, you know, these are the golden years and you want to spend mm -hmm. your, you know, your time traveling around and seeing the world and stuff. You can't find network providers. That's absolutely right. And if you go to out-of-network providers, the costs are increased greatly. Oh, yeah. So those are some of the difficulties that people face. Exactly. Well, when you were talking about how they cherry pick mm -hmm. their enrollees, how did they do that? Well, there are various ways. I'm sure there are some that I have that I just don't know about, but um, we we know that they do because we see that the the people who are in the Medicare Advantage plans are healthier on average than the people in regular Medicare. But so one of the ways would be to offer a free gym membership, for instance, to the patients who sign up for your your plan mm -hmm. that's going to attract people who are healthier the people who are sick the people who are already bed bound somebody with bad uh, asthma bad copd bad heart failure terrible arthritis those people can't take advantage of the gym membership they're not attracted to your plan they'll go somewhere else okay so that's an obvious way to cherry pick mm -hmm. and and you know i know people that are in these plans as well i get a free gym membership right and it's like, they're well, getting that paid by ta for by taxpayers because this is our money that's going to the company, and yet you are a person who doesn't need, chances are, doesn't need that much health care. So the plan is getting extra money, and you're not using care. Right. Another thing that they do is to enroll veterans who are actually getting their care at the veterans' hospitals. So the plan is getting money but not providing any care we're paying for this person to get cared for twice once by the veterans administration and then once by the medicare advantage plan that is just keeping the money mm -hmm. so well and i've heard about them you know holding their informational meetings in third floor walk-ups yeah th that particular uh way to do it might have fallen out of favor by this time but yes that historically that was another way that they used to to uh, cherry pick. Mm -hmm. so, so, so the both of you are outlining this Medicare Advantage that's actually run by a private company yes. with the name of Medicare on it. Right. And this term advantage after that. Oh. Of course, which is, of course, is a PR thing stuck in there to make yes, it sound like it's better than regular Medicare. Mm -hmm. yeah. But this is the influence that the insurance companies have. Well, how did the insurance companies get Congress to agree to this? Oh. Well, I wasn't there, but I, backroom <laughs> deals, money, campaign money, campaign contributions, mm -hmm. inserting their people into the 
into the bureaucracy and the feds, I mean, the, the same way that they contribute, continue to operate now, these huge amounts of money that they spend on lobbying. I mean, they'll, they write legislation, you know, and, mm -hmm. and turn it over to the, to the legislators to pass. Oh yeah, that's common. So, so, so mm -hmm. how, how do we make people knowledgeable of this? I mean, this is a lot of information that you're well, actually giving out. What we're doing right now, Eric. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Is, is a little yeah. bit about how but, we but, do this. But, but you know, but, but one th of the th th things this is coming to being now. Yeah. And one of the things that you know I understood at the time is the insurance companies did go in and say we can do it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. We can do of it cheaper. Can we can do it cheaper. But instead. The Medicare Advantage plans have ended up costing us 14% more than traditional Medicare. Mm -hmm. Something like that, right. And taking care of the, the less sick patients is still getting paid all of that money. Right. And then the other thing that has happened is that they're, they've, um, so one way to address this was to cut back on their payments but then give uh, bonuses to the plans that did a really good job of mm -hmm. taking care of people. Well, it turned out that almost all of the plans got the bonus payments, so that, that wasn't uh, that didn't reduce costs. Pretty low uh, threshold there, huh? Right, <laughs> low threshold. Um, then risk adjustment, so that they would get um, more money for sicker patients. But they they gained that. They they code people so that they actually, after the risk adjustment was put into effect, they actually got more extra money instead of less. Now, uh -huh. now if so, you can explain to our listeners, risk adjustment means that they're assessing how much they might have to pay out on a particular person? Correct, okay. right. What the so the risk factors are for that patient needing a lot of care. Uh -huh. So then they would get paid more money based on that. Mm -hmm. But if they they gained that, so it turned out that they actually got paid even more excess than they did before the risk adjustment was put into effect. So this is what you can expect of these companies. I mean, that's what they put their your premiums into mm -hmm. is figuring out ways to game the system to get more money for their investors and more money for their chief executives to get uh, big bonuses and. Uh, nice retirement packages. Well, That's let's, what they're going to do with our money. Let's go back to to something a, a few that we talked about a few minutes ago. They get paid the full premium amount. Say, you know, it's, it was averaging um, ten thousand one hundred twenty-three dollars per person in two thousand twelve. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the insurance company, Eric enrolls, they get that $10,123. Mm -hmm. Eric only needs $500 worth of care because he's relatively healthy. They pocket mm -hmm. the rest? Correct. Now, now, if it was traditional Medicare, then that money would stay in the pool to cover everyone else. What, that's correct. Now, I, I want to back up and say something. I mean, it's, it's not always a bad thing to have. So that's called capitation, when you uh -huh. get a set amount of money per person per year to take care of somebody. Mm -hmm. It's not, all, not necessarily a bad thing. It, um, it produces less paperwork, for instance. Okay. So you just get a set amount per, per person per year, then you take care of them. Now, Eric might need only $500. There might be somebody else who needs $100,000. Mm -hmm. So it's, it doesn't automatically work out to your advantage. But it should average out so that those people, the, the insurance companies, are not getting paid more than the average cost of an average Medicare patient. Mm -hmm. and that, but that's not what has happened. They get paid a lot more. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, according to the study by PNHP, it was $283.6 billion more. Yeah, I don't remember the number. It was huge. It was huge over a number of years that this Absolutely. has happened. And, and the estimates, um, there's a quote from Ida Hellander that says, in 2012 alone, private insurance are being overpaid $34.1 billion. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a lot of money. That's, that's an all, a lot extremely a lot of money, yes. So <laughs> what do you do? Well, we organize. That's, mm -hmm. that's what the single-payer movement is about. Physicians for a National Health Program... Uh, Span Ohio, the Illinois Single Payer Coalition, all of us are mm -hmm. going out and organizing. Of course, we wish we could change this overnight, and we know that's not possible. But we know that with people working together, starting wherever we are and with whatever resources we have, that this is something that we can and have to change. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, this the um, research article says that Medicare Advantage covers about 27 percent of the Medicare enrollees, so the majority of people are still in traditional Medicare. Correct. And hopefully or maybe have a, a supplemental policy that covers what Medicare doesn't. You know, and, and, and that, of course, is another form of privatized Medicare. And those right. supplements are uh, much less efficient than uh, Medicare itself. You pay, pay more for, what, for getting less. 
yeah. compared to what you get for for what you put into Medicare. Yeah, somebody told me that you know they were paying like a hundred bucks a month for their Medicare, and two hundred bucks a month for their supplemental insurance, and the supplemental mm -hmm. insurance covers the twenty percent that Medicare doesn't cover. Mm. Wow. Right now, twice part of what you're getting from Medicare is is because you know since Medicare started, we have all been paying into that fund right. to keep right. that. So, but yes, in just in terms of the benefits that you get for what what is paid. Uh, by someone, the uh, insurance companies, those supplements are much less efficient than Medicare itself. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and I wonder too about the choices that people have because I'm looking at um, the choice I will have when I reach Medicare age. And I get my insurance through a retirement system. I was a, mm -hmm. a public school teacher, and so I get it through state teachers' retirement system. And basically, there's two choices that I have I could go with a traditional Medicare and um, a supplemental, which would cost me more and cover less, or I can go with the Medicare Advantage plan that they're offering me. Now what happens is that the retirement system is putting some money into this and beefing up this Medicare Advantage plan wow. so that, it, you know, I would have, it's cheaper for me, and uh -huh. I would have far fewer out-of-pocket expenses mm -hmm. under that plan. So of course, you know, financially for me, since I don't have an endless you know, mm -hmm. well of funds there, it, it would make more sense for me to do the, the Medicare Advantage plan. And mm -hmm. I'm going to have a real tough choice to make there because I don't want my money going to that private insurer. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it is a hard choice. So, and so if you're healthy and, you know, don't have any um, serious illnesses, um, the Medicare Advantage plan may well work out well for you as far as finances go. Yeah. And if you get a serious illness, then it becomes another question. And of course, that's the. But you don't even have to have. You don't even have to have a serious illness before uh -huh. it becomes a, uh, a, a problem. And I was just talking with a bunch of people. Kidney stones to be, seem to be really common and very expensive. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and very unpleasant, yeah. Yeah, well, and the un people were having difficulty with getting care for that. Well, paying for them. Paying for them. Yeah. Okay. For so them. They ended up with unexpected out-of-pocket costs. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. One person was uninsured. Her cost was ten thousand. Okay. For being mm -hmm. for care, I was insured. It cost me almost three thousand with insurance out of pocket. Out of pocket. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And I talked to somebody else. Twenty-five hundred out of pocket. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, and that's that's not a serious illness. This is, you know, but but it, it's something that um, that can really hurt the finances. A absolutely, and and then if you imagine getting cancer and having, you know, to see a specialist go see someone once or twice a week, have a twenty dollar copay each time, and a maybe a copay on the medication, and you can see how that just adds up, so that even people who are quite well off are unable to sustain. Well, well Anne and Debbie both, you know, I mean, it would appear that with Medicare being there, the Medicare Advantage, first off, uh, they're trying to get people that they are not going to refer to specialists. I mean, that's that's their whole, whole aim. That's what it seems like. But then if you just take the standard Medicare that's available, uh, you're going to have a higher out-of-pocket expense. Isn't that still better than not having, I mean, what, what other alternative is there? You well, gotta take one or the other. You can't predict for sure uh, wh when and where you're going to have high out-of-pocket expenses. Mm -hmm. And this is the one of the many difficulties in our healthcare system. One one of the things that's so stressful for people. Even if you uh, right now were to choose um, what what is the best plan for you based on your current medical medical, right. mm -hmm. you have no way of predicting what your needs are going to be over the next year. And that can change. So one plan, um, a Medicare Advantage plan, may actually give you less access to certain medicines than you would have under traditional Medicare, for instance. Mm -hmm. So you have no way of knowing that. You can't predict which one is going to be better for you over the course of a year. It's completely impossible. Yeah, and we were having that discussion today at lunch um, when one of the people was saying that, you know, she was the the plan that we're under right now covers no tier three or four drugs okay it, you know just tier one uh -huh. and two and her doctor prescribed crestor for her and that's not covered she has to pay the entire freight of that on her own and the insurance company had recommended lipitor instead 
Mm -hmm. But she had tried the Lipitor, it didn't work, so they put her on the Crestor, wow. which okay. she has gotten good results from. So, you know, where, what are her choices wow. now? Wow, yes, that's a terrible position to be in. So, so and the, the sole reason for being in this position is so that the pharmaceutical and health insurance industries can continue to make their huge profits. That's the only reason she has to be in that position. Mm -hmm. Because and if, we spend more than enough money in our health care system to provide for her Crestor and the kidneys taking care of the kidney stones that all the people you're describing have had. We can pay for those. Yeah. So, so if we, in fact, did have a single-player plan in place, regardless of the medication or the treatment or, or the catastrophic illness that might come upon a person, everything would be, everybody would be on an even kill. Everybody would be taken care of. We right. have enough money to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've got more than enough money to do that. Absolutely. Okay. You know, That's right. With what we're spending in the United States on health care, we could take care of everyone, and if we did it under a single-payer plan, we could do it for less than what we're spending right we now. Could, yeah. We could use the rest of that money for our schools and many of the other things that we need. Exactly. Just for comparison's sake, how many other industrialized countries are administering Medi Medicare or, or, or hospitalization or health care to their uh, populace like us? Oh, I'm, nobody. Uh, nobody? We're the only ones in the world that are doing it like this? That's correct. We're the only ones that have this for-profit health care system that dominates our financing and creates this huge um, dysfunctional, this hugely dysfunctional system that we have. In all of this world, we're the only ones that are doing this? The only industrialized country that has anything like this. Right, right. Okay. We're completely unique <clears throat> in the world. Yeah. We, when it comes to health care, if you look at a world map, we're kind of with Africa. Really? Yes. And, and, um, and some small Asian countries, but the vast majority of the world has a more equitable and universal health care system. Now, they're not all single-payer systems. Right. But if they rely on insurance, um, you know, private insurance for it, generally their insurance companies are far more regulated than ours are mm -hmm. as far as what they right. can and cannot do, and they are not allowed to be for profit. That's correct. They're, they're very strictly regulated. They, their premiums are pres prescribed. Mm -hmm. They even have to pay claims. That, and our insurance companies don't have to pay claims. So there are other countries where if they, their private insurance companies, um, if a claim is submitted, it has to be paid. Mm -hmm. Here our uh, insurance companies can deny payment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I've had claims denied. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah, I, I'm I, sure I, everybody has. Yeah, yeah. I appealed it. That got denied, so I'm appealing it again. Mm -hmm. I know, think that's a standard. You know, we, we've learned to grow up with that, you know. Well, mo a lot of people don't know that. They just give up and pay. Uh-huh. And, uh, and then some people know it, but it's just easier to give up and pay. That's true. Okay. And, in, you know, when we talk about the expense of our health care system, one thing that is not factored into that cost is a, a dollar value put on the time that patients and families devote to fighting with insurance companies. If we were to put a, a dollar value on that time and add that to our health care costs, I don't even know what it would be, mm -hmm. some much larger number. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're the, we have the honor of being the country in which uh, patients and families spend the most time um, dealing with uh, health insurance, with health care bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to say, it, it sounds like an advantage then for our uh, listeners to really get on board with making single payer happen. Well, Absolutely. You know, and, and, you know, and I'm looking at this with the Medicare Advantage plans. This was the private insurers getting in here and messing up the works and stuff, but taking the business away. There's other things that are underway to try and undermine Medicare. Um, you know, we had the big scare with um, Paul Ryan's path to prosperity about turning Medicare into a voucher plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that that scare is over, but then we look at, you know, um, the proposal to raise the Medicare age from 65 to 67, whittling it down again. Yes. Right. A little mm -hmm. bit. And then if sequestration c takes place, um, it's not a change in the benefits for Medicare recipients. What it is is it's um, a drop in um, reimbursement to providers by two percent, which doesn't sound like a lot, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, oh, I'm okay. I've got all my benefits. It's just the providers and that type of thing. But what happens with that is then fewer providers are willing to take Medicare. That's correct. And you know, in Medicare Advantage, uh, Medicare in general, the is costing people more. So the, mm -hmm. every year the deductible goes up, the amount you have to pay before Medicare kicks in. 
there are um, technologies and drugs that have, of course, the Medicare Part D thing, the, the drug benefit is a bureaucratic nightmare, right. and expensive, and so on. So there are many ways in which Medicare is being undermined instead of uh, being strengthened. So, and that just points up the fact that we have to get the health insurance industry out of the financing of health care because they're damaging every single part of our health care system. Mm -hmm. There's no one who's escaping that. Right. You know, the Medicare Part D, the biggest mistake they made there was not allowing for the negotiation of prices. But, of course, from the, from the uh, point of view of the industry, that wasn't a mistake at all. Right. right. So that's, well, that's what the purpose of the Part D is to give them more money. Exactly. You know, and too many people really fall for that argument about, well, if we didn't pay for the, pay these high prices, then the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't have the money to develop the new drugs. Right. Yes, that is, and that's completely false. They spend far more money on uh, marketing than they do on research and development. Much of the research and development, most of the research and development is uh, funded by the public through the National Institutes of Health. Every um, person in the United States who's gotten a Nobel Prize for medicine and physics has had part of his or her funding from the National Institutes of Health. Mm -hmm. That's who does the research. Then the pharmaceutical companies take it over to complete the last steps, put it on the market, get it, get their patents, and start making uh, you know billions of dollars out of the drugs. Mm -hmm. Or they put research into, devel into developing a drug that's just enough different to get a new patent so that their drug doesn't go off patent and become less expensive. Mm -hmm. Which is exactly what they do most of the time when one of the drugs is going to go off patent, mm -hmm. is that they exactly. change one little thing in it. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that, you know, in order to keep, you know, to have it on patent and so and that sort of thing. And I, I, I want to ask you something. As, as a provider, if the sequestration did take place and there's a reduction in the amount of funds that would be coming back to you, let's say 2% less, would you as a provider drop patients? I mean, can doctors actually afford to drop patients and not treat them simply because they're getting less back? Well, um, all of my patients had Medicare. That was the, I took regular Medicare. I, I didn't take anything else. So if I were, uh, still wanted to continue my practice and this happened, I would probably just live with it. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's going to differ from one physician to another. And I have to say my, the very first practice that I had after I had completed my training, I had to leave because I couldn't make a living at it. So if I were in that position, I'd have to, leave my patients, yes, and go do something else. Uh -huh. I yeah. went to get a, a job, a paid job with somebody, with a hospital, because I couldn't make it in my practice. So there could be difficult decisions like that that you'd have to make. And I do know physicians who find themselves uh, starting to go into debt mm -hmm. um, because they can't keep up with their the payments are late from the insurance companies or the billing systems are so complex that they have, they're not getting paid on time. And if that happens, then yes, you do have to do something different. So well, and I'm sure there will be physicians mm -hmm. who, are, who are going to give up taking Medicare. You know, maybe not at 2%, but then when the next 2% comes right, and right, then the next, right. and then it gets, you know, we have this problem already with Medicaid because the reimbursements mm -hmm. are so low. Many, many physicians won't take Medicaid. And there's also this, and, and here's what you have to really watch out for. There's this new trend, it actually it's not new, that, but you know, it's becoming more popular, of hospitals buying up physician practices. Yes, they are. And I've heard Absolutely. of insurance companies buying up physician practices. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. some of the hospitals in those physician practices refuse to allow their primary care doctors to see Medicaid patients. That's correct. And there have been doctors who were fired for not bringing in enough money for, uh, for you know, uh, not putting, there have been doctors fired for not putting enough people in the hospital, if you can believe that. We had one, so. we had one right here in the Cleveland yes, area that I that happened. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, the, yeah, he's a good friend funny. of mine. And okay. it was non-productivity, they said, but he was taking too much time with his patients and he refused to admit more patients to the hospital um, to up the hospital's uh, bottom line. He said, my job's to keep them out of the hospital. Absolutely. So that, that's, that's just a fabulous example of how crooked, how screwed up our system is. Mm -hmm. That that can be a criteria for letting uh, go a doctor who's doing a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, when we're looking at the Medicaid, okay, we're providing this for people, we've salved our conscience, but we aren't paying the providers enough so that they're willing to take them because most providers will tell you they lose money mm -hmm. on Medicaid patients. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, so, and, so, so the, the the rules that govern Medicaid and Medicare right now are what just rules that are on the books that say that are saying that well at least we put it put it there for people to take advantage of, but there's right. no real advantage of it at, at all. Well, well, I wouldn't not, say that there's none. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's, if you have Medicaid, that's better than having nothing. Exactly. It's, okay. But it's, it, it, again, we're a rich country. It shouldn't be the case that you have to settle for better than nothing. Mm -hmm. We can afford for people to have what they need, mm -hmm. not just better than nothing. It, you know, uh, just a, a good example is dental care. In Illinois, um, adults used to get... Um, adults with Medicaid used to get dental care, and that's been dropped. The only mm -hmm. kind of care that's that people can get is extractions. In some states, uh, people can get their front teeth taken care of, but not their other teeth. Um, it, we can take care of everybody's dental care. Mm -hmm. And to say that people should have to do that, to separate that out, that part of your body, and say that you, you can't have that, it's humiliating to people. It's bad for their health. Um, well, it's you know, it's wrong. It's dehumanizing to them. It's dehumanizing, exactly. And uncivilized, there are lots of names we could give to it. It's mm -hmm. wrong. You know, and we have to we have to understand in this country, and we have to come to a realization in this country, that every person deserves the same high quality care. Absolutely. And if that Medicaid recipient is getting the same high quality care that I'm getting, it's not going to take away from what I've got. Right. I'm going to retain. Quite the contrary. You know, the only way that you retain the, the good that you have is by making sure everybody else has it as well. That's absolutely true. And it's by knowing what's, uh, what it works to take care of people that we're all taken better care of. Right. You know, if we wouldn't have uh, the, the high quality of hip replacement surgery, for instance, that we have now if there hadn't been thousands of people who could get hip replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. That's how we learn to make things better. Mm -hmm. Right. We all benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, and one of the things that, that this brings to mind, too, when we're talking about the same high-quality care, is um, what they did out in Grand Junction. It's not a single-payer plan, which is what I would favor, but this was a, a, just a kind of a small experiment that they did out there. But they banded together, and they got the Medicaid contract for the county. They um, set themselves up as a Medicare Advantage plan, and then they had private insurers that were coming in, you know, private companies that bought mm -hmm. in, so they had that. And what they did is they, you know, it's kind of like an all-payer system okay. because all the payers paid into the pot. But what they did is when they did the reimbursements, they were equalized across the board. So all when right. that patient right. went in, the Medicaid patient, the Medicare patient, and the private insured patient all paid the same rate. You know, uh -huh. when they went into that provider. What they found that they could do is that um, they saved a lot of money, but they really saved a ton of money on acute care for Medicaid patients because it really opened up the possibilities. They got better um, specialist care and they got better primary care because of it. You know, Anne, this has been really great. You brought a lot to the forefront. You've given a lot of understanding, and we've said a lot of things that I, I imagine are going to cause people to really take a look and see what this, this healthcare system in this industrialized nation that is so rich is actually not doing. Right. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. Time is running out, though. And okay, thank you, we've got and so much. Thank you so much. Oh, you're well, quite you've welcome. been great to have on the show, Ann. Thank you for, for bringing this information to us and talking to us about it. You know, Debbie, uh, can you tell us what what's up and coming? Um, I can tell you one of the things that's up and coming. Okay. Um, I'm not going to tell you who next month's guest is, though. All right. Okay. That's surprise gonna, us It's going to be a surprise. <laughs> um, but we are hosting here in Ohio. Span Ohio is, is, is hosting and collaborating with a Broadway actor, Michael, Michael Milligan, to bring his um, one-act play to Ohio called Mercy Killers. And it deals with a, a lot of the questions we're talking about here, not the Medicare Advantage, but the, the Medicaid coverage, the private insurance coverage, and what happens here in the land of plenty when somebody becomes seriously ill. So you can check our website, that's spanohio.org, for the dates and locations of when that play is going to take place. It's free, you know, free admission, open to the public. Just check the website. You know, reserve your seat and come see it because, I, you know, I saw it Monday night. It was excellent. He moved people to tears. Really? Yes. Okay. And in well, fact, I'm we were told. Looking forward to it. <laughs> we were told we better pass out Kleenex to people as they go in.
Wow. You know, so. Wow. And again, I want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, I'd like to remind our listeners that, in fact, there is a comment block. And if there's anything that you've heard that you agree, disagree with, want to make a comment on. Or, or ask a question. Or ask a question or bring up a different issue, you're more than welcome to. Uh, and again, I want to thank you, and, I, and you have a good night.